Thank you to the organizers for the invitation to speak. Uh, it's been a great pleasure to be here. Uh, so I'm going to talk about some generalizations of uh, rigidity theorem of Eklund and Lazari. Uh, and so let me just uh, start with the star of the show, which is their theorem. Uh, so this is a theorem about closed characteristics on convex hypersurfaces in R2n. Uh, so uh, the players are as following. Let's just consider uh, hypersurface. In R2n with its standard symplectic structure, so this is a hypersurface. Uh, and this could be actually uh, any symplectic manifold, so maybe we'll do it in the general case here. Uh, and the hypersurface inherits uh, a special line bundle, so L sigma, which is just the kernel of omega restricted to sigma. Uh, and closed characteristics are defined by this line bundle in the following way. So a closed characteristic of sigma is a submanifold P of sigma uh, diffeomorphic to the circle. Uh, such that uh, the tangent space of this submanifold uh, is equal to the line bundle restricted to the submanifold. Uh, and so this is really a geometric object, and these geometric objects are uh, related to the periodic orbits we've been hearing so much about uh, in the following ways, uh, if we express our hypersurface sigma as a level set of a function, so a regular level set, uh, then the Hamiltonian vector field of that function restricted to the hypersurface uh, spans our line bundle on sigma, uh, and <clears throat> closed characteristics are in one-to-one -one correspondence uh, with simple closed trajectories of xh. Uh, on sigma, which is its level set, a level set. Uh, more uh, specifically, if sigma is of contact type, uh, so this has been defined previously uh, by Victor, but let me just remind you uh, that at least near sigma, the symplectic form <clears throat> is exact, and if you take uh, the primitive lambda and restrict it to sigma as a contact form, uh, and for such hypersurfaces, the closed characteristics on sigma are in one-to-one -one correspondence with the closed reborbits of the contact form. So the simple ones.
Okay. Uh, and so now we can state the theorem of Ethland and Lazari, which I'll call theorem one. And it says the following. Uh, so let's let sigma be a hypersurface in R2n now. So it's compact. Hypersurface uh, under the following two hypotheses. So if sigma is convex and satisfies the following pinching condition. So if we look at uh, a point on sigma and look at its norm, that uh, is always between 1 and uh, root 2. So in pictures, uh, We have two spheres, so this sphere uh, of dimension 2n minus 1 and radius 1, and this sphere of the same dimension of radius root 2, and somewhere between them lies a convex sigma. Uh, then. The theorem tells us that sigma uh, carries at least n plus 1 closed characteristics. Uh, and in case I forget to mention it later, this lower bound is sharp. So uh, if you look at uh, an ellipsoid, uh, symplectic ellipsoid, if you like, whose cross-sectional symplectic areas are rationally independent, uh, then that will have exactly m plus 1 closed characteristics corresponding to the intersections of the ellipsoid uh, with the symplectic things. All right. Uh, so before I describe uh, the generalizations uh, of this rigidity theorem, uh, I'd like to put it in kind of a, yeah, uh, okay, uh, uh, a context within symplectic topology. So I'd like to compare it to some other theorems. Uh, and to make the comparison meaningful, uh, it's good to change the natural perspective that the statement gives you. So this pinching condition makes it look like, um, well, one can interpret it as, uh, these two spheres are influencing the dynamics on the hypersurface in some kind of symmetric way. Uh, in order to generalize this, I, this phenomenon, it's more useful to think of the influences coming from one of the spheres and the range of influences being bound by the other sphere. Okay, so uh, I would recommend the following change of perspective view influence on sigma as coming from S2n minus 1 uh, with radius 1 uh, and the range of influence defined by S2n minus 1 root 2. Uh, so I understand that range of influence is a vague term here. I'll try to make it more precise later, but this is just one way to view the hypothesis. Uh, and if viewed from this way, uh, it 
compares nicely to other rigidity theorems in symplectic topology whose uh, range is somehow bounded. Okay, uh, so we saw one of these yesterday. Uh, so this beautiful theorem of Chikhanov. My notation straight. Uh, so suppose uh, we have a Lagrangian L uh, and we look at its image under the time one flow uh, of well, a, a Hamiltonian diffeomorphism, so the time one flow of a Hamiltonian vector field, and that these two submanifolds are transverse. Okay, uh, so it's familiar that we want to study the intersection points. And so Chikana tells us then the number of intersection points is greater than or equal to uh, the sum of Betty numbers of L as long as the Hofer norm of H, uh, the time-dependent Hamiltonian function giving us this time one, uh, well, giving us this Hamiltonian diffeomorphism is less than uh, uh, the symplectic area of any uh, sphere or disk with boundary on L in the ambient symplectic manifold. <clears throat> so let me write that out. So we want to take formally the soup over J compatible with omega. And then we want to take the minimum area of J holomorphic spheres and disks uh, with boundary on L. So for every uh, such j, this is a positive number, and if you take the super for all j, this is still this is of course a positive number. Uh, so one can view this as uh, a rigidity theorem, which holds over a bounded range of uh, h's, where the range of h is measured in terms of its Hofer norm. Okay. Uh, another result from symplectic topology, which fits this description. is a theorem due to Schwartz, Matthias Schwartz. So let's say that M omega is rational. Uh, so we need to see what that means. So if you take omega and you apply it to pi 2 of m, uh, the image looks like sigma times z for some sigma greater than 0. OK? <clears throat> uh, then Schwartz tells us uh, then if you look at a Hamiltonian diffeomorphism uh, and you try to bound from below the minimum number of fixed points. This is greater than or equal to the cup length of m plus 1 uh, if Again, the Hofer norm of H in this case is less than or equal to sigma. Okay, so again, we get a bounded range. All right, uh, so uh, these theorems tell kind of complete stories in themselves, uh, but they also suggest things that should also be, might also be true. Uh, for instance, if one looks at the Eklund and Lazary theorem, it is compelling evidence for the still open conjecture that every convex hypersurface 
carries at least n plus one close characteristic. Uh, all right, so Tikhanov's theorem is a, is a bit of an outsider. It's really a complete statement in itself when you consider displaceable Lagrangians. But suppose that we lived in a universe where this was proved before uh, Lagrangian floor theory was invented. Then one might ask, are there Lagrangians for which this bound is not there? Okay, and then perhaps one would have reinvented Lagrangian floor theory for things like monotone Lagrangians and uh, found a, a larger range of symplectic rigidity uh, results. But this is also complete. This is true uh, for displaceable Lagrangians. And of course, Schwartz's theorem is recognizable as uh, a partial proof of the strong Arnold conjecture. Uh, so Arnold conjectured that the number of fixed points of any Hamiltonian diffeomorphism should be uh, at least uh, as large as the minimum number of critical points of a function on M. So this is a well-known topological bound for that number. <coughs> and uh, Schwartz established it uh, as long as the Hofer norm of H is not bigger than this rationality function. OK. Uh, so uh, the goal of uh, this kind of project is to take the Eklund and Lazare theorem and make it less specialized. So here we're talking about symplectic manifolds. Here we're talking about hypersurfaces in R2M. Okay? So it turns out that there is a more general rigidity theorem, uh, which is most usefully described in terms of reflows, that captures this and generalizes it. And so I want to talk about this a few steps in this project. <coughs> All right, so before we go on to generalizations, uh, it makes sense to linger on the Eklund and Lazare theorem, maybe uh, take some time analyzing the assumptions and the ideas inherent in the proof, because these are the things we'll want to capture and generalize. <coughs> All right. All right, so let's start with uh, the assumptions. So the first one is convexity. Uh, and that, that's really the doozy. Um, uh, so convexity is a very useful and geometrically natural assumption. Consider convex objects like Ramanian metrics all the time uh, in geometry, but in terms of a symplectic assumption, it's not so natural. This is kind of what I mean. It's easy to take a convex hypersurface, act by a symplectomorphism, and get a not convex hypersurface. This is not a, a symplectically invariant notion. <clears throat> uh, but let's see what it gives one in this context. Uh, so first of all, it implies that our hypersurface that we're considering is diffeomorphic to the sphere. Uh, it also implies that it's of contact type. <clears throat> of course, these are assumptions we can make beforehand in a symplectically invariant way. Uh, but then the next list uh, of implications is, does not fall in that description. Uh, so first of all, this tells us quite a, vin a bit of information about the closed characteristics which can arise on sigma. Okay. Uh, so in particular, uh, if P is a closed characteristic, closed characteristic on sigma, its symplectic area. Well, I already, I already described that a closed characteristic on sigma of contact type is in one-to-one -one correspondence with a closed Lieb orbit, a simple closed Lieb orbit. So let's keep track of both objects at the, top, uh, at the same time. Uh, 
so the Kogel's characteristic has symplectic area and the simple closed Reeb orbit has period. Turns out that these are equal uh, numbers and they're both bounded from below. Uh, by <clears throat> the cross-sectional area of the largest ball which fits inside of sigma. Cross-sectional symplectic area. So you can say capacity of the largest ball which embeds inside of sigma so by the pinching condition in this setting, that would be pi. Okay, so every closed characteristic on a convex sigma like this has symplectic area bounded by pi and the corresponding closed Reeb orbit has period bounded below by pi. Uh, so this is not an obvious fact. This is a nice theorem uh, due to Croak and Weinstein. Uh, and uh, with good timing, I can also we can also talk about the comedy Zender index of uh, the closed Reeb orbit in this case, and it also comes uh, with a lower bound due to convexity. So the uh, comedy Zender index a closed Reeb orbit on sigma is greater than or equal to m plus 1. Okay, uh, this is also not an obvious fact. Uh, this is a theorem proved by Eklund. So he had his own version of Morse theory for the study of closed Reeb orbits on convex hypersurfaces. He had his own version of index, but in this context, it's equal to the Conley Zender index, or at least it, it's related to the Conley Zender index in the fact that uh, we get this lower bound for the Conley Zender index. <coughs> all right. Uh, so these are all extremely useful when studying the variational principle that one studies to uh, look at closed Reeb orbits. These are very useful assumptions. And sometimes people uh, replace convexity, if it's not appropriate, uh, with these implications. So in particular, if you assume that all closed Reeb orbits have Conley Zender index greater than or equal to m plus one, this is usually called dynamic convexity. Okay. <coughs> all right, uh, so one other implication of convexity, which will be important in our discussion of Eklund and Lazarus theorem is that uh, Closed Reeb orbits correspond to critical points well there will be a usual functional the action functional in, in uh, Hamiltonian floor theory but there's also uh, an alternative Uh, so I will give a very brief description of this. Uh, and when one looks at it from the, dual, the, looks at the problem from the perspective of the dual variational principle, an amazing picture arises which we would like to also capture uh, or capture in some way using Hamiltonian floor homology. But let me get to the picture first. Okay, uh, so. Let's uh, briefly take the path uh, that the proof of this theorem follows. Uh, 
Uh, and the first step is to pass uh, from fixed energy, which is just another way of saying and looking at one hypersurface of a Hamiltonian uh, to fixed period. Okay, and one way to do that <coughs> is to <coughs> construct a function who which has sigma as a regular level set and all of whose other level sets, uh, the dynamics and all, all the other level sets of this uh, function are the are uh, conjugate to those on sigma. Okay, so you can kind of study a family of copies of the dynamics on sigma all at once and look for periodic orbits on any of these level sets and they'll correspond to periodic orbits on sigma itself. Uh, so this is very easy to do. Uh, we're going to do it in a, a way which leads us to the dual variational principle. So we're going to uh, describe sigma as H inverse of one. So it's uh, the level set corresponding to value one where the function H has the following property. Uh, we want it to be homogeneous of some degree. Okay, this will give us these conjugate dynamics. Okay, uh, so what exponent do we choose? Uh, well, that's a choice. Uh, so natural choices are one or two, uh, but it turns out the dual variational principle only reveals its secrets if you choose a number greater than one and less than two. Uh, <coughs> so, uh, uh, so the tradition is put an alpha here and say alpha is between one and two. I'm just going to put three halves. Okay, just make it concrete. Okay, so this is just a choice that I've made for the description. There are other choices. Uh, so, for example, if our hypersurface was the sphere of radius r, then h of z is naturally the norm of z over r to the three halves. Okay? And I'll call this h sub r because I'm going to say this. Uh, okay, uh, so this is uh, a, a well-defined function on R2n. <clears throat> it has a Hamiltonian vector field and we can look at its one periodic orbits. It might have a, it has a smoothness problem at the origin, but it's not, it's not relevant. Um, <clears throat> So periodic orbits of xh of period one, uh, which are simple. These occur on some level set of h, uh, but the dynamics on all the level sets are conjugate. Uh, so these all correspond, no matter what level they appear, to uh, closed characteristics on sigma. All right, so now it looks like the task is to find as many one periodic orbits of xh as we can and hope that that number is at least n plus one. Uh, so, well, we've kind of seen a tool to do that, but it turns out not to be the right tool, but we might as well talk about it anyway. We could try to use these objects as the critical points of the action functional uh, that we've seen many times in the lectures. <coughs> uh, so let me fix my conventions. Uh, I think they agree with the ones that are, have been given. So if we have X, uh, a map from S1 to R2N, its action is defined for the one H X of T D T, our, our Hamiltonian is autonomous, and our symplectic form is exact, so we can uh, actually just make this one integral 
over the uh, unit interval So J is the standard compatible complex structure with a standard symplectic structure. Uh, and this is just minus the symplectic area in disguise. <coughs> All right. Uh, good. Uh, so it's, it's worthwhile to consider how far one can get with this variational principle. Okay. Uh, so we are interested in the function H. And our hypersurface was pinched by two spheres. So for each of those spheres, we can consider these uh, example functions with the same property. And it's not too hard to see that H is uh, greater than H root 2 and less than H1. The corresponding functions for the unit sphere and the sphere of radius root 2. Okay, And so when one sees such a relationship between three functions, it's natural to look for periodic orbits using Hamiltonian floor homology uh, in what's become a standard way. Uh, so one considers some version of floor homology uh, for the biggest function and looks at continuation maps which relate floor homologies for different choices of functions. Uh, and these maps have the beautiful property that uh, they, they factor. So this factors for a map to the floor homology of H0, sorry, H. Okay? Uh, and so theoretically, if we could prove that these were non trivial and the map between them was non trivial, then there must be something in the middle which corresponds to a closed characteristic, and we could ask how many can we find this way? Uh, it turns out that this is not fruitful. Uh, so for such functions, the relevant version of floor homology would be something like symplectic homology. And that vanishes here. So both sides are zero. Uh, one can choose uh, better Hamiltonians. Okay, You don't have to have them go to infinity uh, if they uh, just were steep enough. Uh, we could actually uh, prove the existence of one closed characteristic this way. Uh, but we're after n plus 1, uh, so we need some something else. <coughs> yes? Well, the slope is increasing, so. The slope and period are related. It's like in symplectic homology. This thing is the derivative, is, except it with a function that's uh, quadratic instead of linear as infinity. Except it's not quadratic, it's three halves. Uh, the slope is still increasing. So the period, it's seeing things of larger and larger period the farther you go out. Yeah. Is it the square or not linear? Uh, 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 yes, you are correct. It's actually tangent to itself. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, right. So it, it's very likely that symplectic, something like symplectic homology would not be well defined for something like this. You're, yeah. Uh, but if you replaced it by, yeah, yeah no, you're, 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 that's true. Uh, but nevertheless, with uh, Hamiltonian floor homology and this, using this kind of mechanism, uh, you, you can't get n plus one closed characteristics, no matter what Hamiltonian you choose. Uh, so we need a, to consider this dual variational principle. So let me tell you what uh, it looks like. Uh, so the first thing to do is to take it advantage of the fact that sigma is convex uh, to define the Legendre transform of that H. Okay. Uh, 
the fire. The zombie transform of that H to the H with the three half vector. All right. Uh, so uh, we use the notation H star. Uh, and H star of W is equal to the soup over Z Okay, so in particular, uh, so for example, if we took H uh, R star of W, uh, let me get the constants right, <clears throat> it's one third and then uh, three R to the two thirds over two times W now cubed. All right, uh, and we have this new function and we now consider a new uh, functional on MOOCs. Uh, so this new functional is called the Clark dual of the original one. So uh, it's defined on loops y, and it makes sense to uh, restrict to y's with average zero. Okay, uh, and the functional is the following. We won't use this formula for anything, uh, but for reference, uh, so let me just tell you what this operator uh, pi is. Uh, so pi y is defined by the following two properties. If you take pi y and then d by dt of it, uh, you get y. So it's some kind of integration. <clears throat> and uh, then we need to set the constant, so the integral from zero to one of pi y uh, dt equals zero. All right, uh, so here are the important features of this new functional, which is so far unmotivated. <clears throat> uh, its critical points correspond to the things we're looking for. Okay. So theorem, Clark, if y is a critical point of that functional, then uh, <clears throat> x equals pi y. So y is like the, it's like we found the derivative of that. Uh, plus z naught is in the critical point set of our original functional. So it's a closed one periodic orbit of our original function h uh, for some z naught. Uh, okay, so we've changed one calculus problem into another, and it's not clear that we've gotten anywhere, but so here's the uh, point. This functional is bounded from below.
that's good news, but it's not enough to save us. We can just take a minimizing sequence and get a one minimum uh, and, and get a close characteristic. Uh, but because of this, <clears throat> the pinching condition uh, now uh, paints a beautiful picture. So, uh, so if you view pinching in the light of this variational principle, you get the following result. So I'll call this a proposition. Either Eklund and Lazari, uh, which says the following. There exists a C less than zero such that the sublevel psi C, so that's psi inverse of minus infinity C, which is a nice object now because the foundation below, uh, <coughs> is non-empty. S1 acts freely on the sublevel, uh, and there exists uh, an S1 equivariant embedding isometry, isometric embedding of S to N minus one into this sublevel. So in terms of variational calculus, this sublevel is the happiest place on earth. I mean, this, these are exactly the things we want, okay? So this sub, this non-empty subdomain <coughs> of the loop space is comprised entirely of simple loops. S1 acts freely, okay? So that means any critical point we find here is going to correspond to a simple closed uh, Hamiltonian vector field. Uh, not only that, uh, S1 acts freely, so we can consider the quotient. And that quotient, the topology of that quotient is as rich as the topology of the quotient of S to N minus one mod S1. So as rich as CPN. So that means that when we do critical point theory in this happy place, we get at least M plus one critical points. And so uh, we get, this is how Eklund and Lazari prove their theory. Okay? Uh, so motivated by this amazing uh, picture, we're going to use uh, Hamiltonian floor theory to try to, well, we, we can't replicate this picture. It's just too specific and too precise, but uh, we can try to uh, understand, uh, try to replicate it as much as possible. Okay? And that's what we'll do. And uh, along the way, we can recover and generalize Eklund and Lazarus theory. Okay, uh, any questions so far? Yes, uh, so to identify this neighborhood, the pinching condition is used. Uh, so exactly what C you choose depends on the constant, dep depends on the pinching condition. The fact that C even exists. I, I, because I haven't shown you where it comes from, that, that fact is taken care of, it's taken care of. And so, Curiously, for alpha equals two, you can't identify this region. Uh, that's just a curiosity I, I bring out. <laughs> I mean, I know why by the formulas, but not by this. <coughs> okay. Uh, so to try to start to capture this picture using Hamiltonian uh, floor theory, uh, we're gonna restate Eklund and Lazarus theorem in terms of replay. Okay. So here is a theorem which is equivalent to theorem one. So uh, let's let lambda not be the standard 
tight contact form. on S to N minus 1. Okay? So this read flow is generating the hot flow uh, and let's say it has period time. Okay? So all the orbits are closed. So in particular as an influencer of nearby dynamics it has a CPN N's worth of closed leave orbit, simple closed leave orbits. Right? The fibers of the hot vibration. Okay? Uh, <clears throat> So theorem one prime, which I will show is equivalent to Eklund and Lazari theorem, is the following. Suppose we have another contact form uh, <coughs> defining the same contact structure. Okay, so they're related by uh, multiplication by non-vanishing function f, and just for <coughs> simple. Uh, just to simplify things, I always assume that F is positive. Okay? So this is a new contact form, uh, same contact structure, but the read dynamics can be completely different. Okay? Uh, so any star shaped hypersurface in R2N it inherits a contact form of this type, but the dynamics on star shaped hypersurfaces can be much different than those on convex hypersurfaces. Which are different. Okay. <coughs> Uh, so what can we say about the read dynamics of this new contact form? Uh, so we'll say the following. If max f over min f is less than 2, <coughs> so uh, So this is a simple C0 condition on F. <coughs> C, uh, C, no, uh, L, L infinity condition. You just care about the max and the min. Uh, then uh, lambda has at least n plus 1 distinct closed reborders. So I claim that uh, this implies the Eklund and Lazarus theorem. Uh, so uh, let me just remind you uh, that, so recall, we have two closed reb orbits, gamma and gamma tilde. These are distinct. If gamma tilde cannot be written in terms of gamma reparameterized in such a way okay <clears throat> uh, and they are geometrically distinct If uh, let me say it like this, their images are not the same, and uh, so geometrically distinct implies distinct. That's clear, but it doesn't go the other way. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, gamma and gamma tilde could both be distinct, uh, but relatively prime iterations of the same root orbit. Okay, so this could be two times some orbit, three times some orbit. And then you couldn't write it like this, but they wouldn't be geometrically distinct. Okay? Uh, but it is true that if these are both simple and distinct, then they're geometrically distinct. Okay? Right. So that's what we'll use.
All right, so before I show that this implies the Eklund and Lazari theorem, uh, let me just make a, a simple observation. Uh, so the range of applicability is in terms of this quantity, max f over min f. Uh, so one can uh, just find something like a distance between lambda and lambda naught uh, as, let's say, the logarithm of max f over min f. Uh, so this is uh, and one can quantify the range of applicability in terms of this notion of distance. So it's not true that this is a distance, so this is a pseudometric. Because uh, you can scale f in any way you like, and the quantity doesn't change. <clears throat> uh, but nevertheless, it's a reasonable notion of distance, and it's, of course, very similar to the Hofer norm. It's the logarithm of the max minor, the logarithm of the min. Uh, so if you want to think in geometric terms about the range of this phenomenon, you can think of it in this way. All right. <coughs> so let me now show that theorem 1 prime implies uh, the Ethan and Lazari theorem. So let's uh, go back to the setting of the Ethan and Lazari theorem. So we're given our convex and pinched hypersurface in R2n. Okay. Uh, and then we can relate it to the objects in uh, theorem 1 prime. In the following way, we can write sigma as the set of, so first we'll take z's in S2n minus 1, 1, so the unit sphere. Uh, and then we can describe, uh, so for Every z, there's a corresponding function on sigma. <coughs> sigma is convex. So you just take a line from the origin to the point in sig, to the point in S1, and you get to a point in a unique point in sigma. Uh, and the radius of that can be described by a function of the form of square root of f of z, so some smooth function. That's a smooth function, so that's a smooth function. And it's not a coincidence that the same symbol f appears on both sides. <clears throat> uh, what do we know about f by the pinching condition? f takes values between 1 and 2. Okay? <clears throat> because the radii are the square roots and they take values between 1 and root 2. All right? Uh, and so. One can picture in this way a diffeomorphism from the unit circle to our convex hypersurface, and it takes closed characteristics on sigma uh, in one-to-one uh, -one correspondence with closed, simple closed Lie borders. of lambda, okay? These loops on sigma go to some loops on uh, the sphere, and the loops they go to are the closed Lie orbits of this contact point. This is a simple contact. Uh, and so it turns out that the omega area of these things and the period of these things are equal, okay? Uh, okay, so now we want to see that Theorem 1 prime implies that sigma has at least n plus 1 uh, close characteristics. Uh, so it does imply that we have at least n plus 1 distinct closed Lie orbits. Uh, but these 
uh, are not necessarily geometrically distinct yet. Uh, so uh, we have to show that they disagree. <clears throat> All right. Uh, so let's look at one of them. It's true that uh, any one of them covers some simple closed leaf orbit. Okay. Okay. Uh, and that simple closed leaf orbit corresponds to a closed characteristic on sigma by this corresponding. Okay. And so now we use convexity. So we started with a convex hypersurface and we saw that one of the implications of convexity was that the areas of the closed characteristics are bounded by the uh, capacities of the large, largest balls that fit inside. And so by the pinching condition, this has area greater than or equal to pi. So here we've used convexity. Plus Croke uh, and Weinstein. And I've missed a part of the assertion here. The orbits we detect have periods between uh, min f pi and pi max f. That's what we have here. All right. Uh, good. Uh, good. So that means that uh, the period of the simple orbit is at least pi, uh, which means that the period of this orbit is at least pi, but it can't be greater than two pi. Uh, so this implies that uh, gamma j is actually simple. So all these orbits are simple and distinct and hence geometrically distinct. Okay. So theorems like three point, or sorry, one prime, are capture the same phenomenon as the ecton lazari theorem. And so now we're going to start to prove theorems which generalize them, or hold a more general setting. Okay. Uh, so let me state the first of these. Uh, so if we're, we're first going to generalize uh, this kind of result uh, from contact forms in the sphere uh, to contact forms of boosby wang types. So contact forms on pre-quantization spaces, okay? Which includes this. Uh, so let's uh, recall the objects in the pre-quantization space. So we're given a symplectic manifold Q of dimension 2n. It's got a symplectic form omega Q. Uh, and the class of omega Q divided by 2 pi is integral. Let's say equals minus E, which is uh, integral cohomology class. Okay, uh, and then one can consider an S1 bundle with total space M over Q. Uh, 
uh, sorry, with first term class E. Uh, and then M admits uh, a natural contact form, uh, a Bucci ring form. Lambda Q. And uh, one thing we know about Lambda Q is that its reflow is generating the circular action. Circle action, the fiber wise circle action uh, with period will normalize it to pi r. Okay? Uh, okay, and then there's one more object we need to identify. Let's let alpha big F in the free homotopy uh, group of M be the class of the fiber. Okay? Uh, so this is generalizes the setup of starting with the standard con tight contact form on F2N minus 1. We have a similar type of Reeb dynamics. All the orbits are closed. Uh, and we're going to prove a, a similar type of statement. I'll call this theorem A. So let's let, again, lambda be another contact form on our pre-quantization space M, representing the same contact structure, but having a different dynamics because we've got this function F. Uh, and then, actually the same statement holds. If max f over min f is less than 2, or if you like the distance we defined is less than 2, <coughs> uh, then lambda has at least n plus 1 distinct closed Reeb orbits. This time in class alpha f and with period in the interval pi min f pi max f. Okay? Uh, so here there's a bit of a happy twist, uh, but to get geometrically distinct. Here, uh, we had to invoke convexity of some kind. Um, <clears throat> so here, there are, in theorem A, there are settings in which we don't have to invoke convexity to get geometrically distinct orbits. So these orbits are geometrically distinct if alpha f is either primitive or of infinite order. Okay, so under either of those topological circumstances, we will get geometrically distinct uh, m plus 1 geometrically distinct closed Reeb orbits. Uh, if neither of them hold, then we would have to assume something else. Uh, and we can state an assumption. Otherwise, G 
geometrically distinct if no closed orbits of period 1 over the order of this class. So we're already assuming that we don't have infinite order because the order is finite. Uh, and then it's max f minus min f pi here. Okay. So these are these uh, these cutoff periods can be very small. So I will often refer to these as fast periodicals. Okay. <clears throat> but nevertheless, uh, if we have no such orbits, then the ones we detect are also geometrically distinct because they fall in this range and there's not enough time for something to generate one of them and then another. Okay. Uh, and we can add another caveat. Uh, if a, such an orbit exists, uh, it would have to appear in the class beta such that beta to the k equals alpha f for some k bigger than 1. Uh, so this is not uh, usually a checkable assumption to find geometrically distinct orbits, but you have now an alternative. Either these are geometrically distinct or you have one of these fast objects. Uh, <clears throat> the fiber is contractible. Uh, the fiber is contractible. Uh, uh, then this condition is never. Uh, I mean, fiber is contractible. You're getting this. This is statement. Uh, so just a remark, uh, so Victor and Bashak and Leonardo Maccarini uh, also considered uh, flows on pre-quantization spaces and uh, I'm not going to state their results but they made some observations which are relevant here. Uh, the class alpha f is primitive if q is symplectically aspherical uh, and it has infinite order if pi 1 of q has uh, no torsion. So there are some natural conditions which we can have. I'll state the results later when I do a, at the end of uh, one of the talks. Right? Okay. So uh, now we would like to get to a more general setting even. So I claim that the actual rigidity ph phenomenon is very general. It really can be uh, detected for certain reflows on any contact manifold. Okay, so I want to get to a, as general a statement as we can make. Okay, so let's just consider a contact manifold which is closed. Okay, and so what kind of statement can we make? All right, so. One obstacle we have to overcome is that we don't have any obvious influencing dynamics, right? So for pre-quantization spaces, we had this circle action, okay? Uh, so we have to define things which are behaving like that. We have to identify them, okay? So, uh, so now we have to build up some language so that we can state some definitions. Uh, okay, so we need to identify a collection of orbits which can, of a particular contact form, lambda naught, which can influence nearby ones. Okay, uh, so we need uh, first, we're going to fix a free homotopy class. Okay, 
Uh, and then we're going to identify certain quantities. So first is uh, T min, which is the minimum period of any closed orbit. Of lambda naught, so this is always exists. <coughs> Let's see. Uh, and then we're going to consider the set of all periods of orbits which represent class alpha. Okay. There are none. I'm just stuck. <laughs> okay. Uh, and then we consider the smallest element in here. So this is the smallest period of any closed rebo orbit in class alpha. Okay. Uh, and now we need a collection of orbits in class alpha. So uh, we choose a period in class. Uh, so for T in this set of periods, uh, let C alpha T equal the collection of all. Uh, closed Reeve orbits in class alpha with period less than or equal to T. Okay, we're just taking some subset of the orbits with period uh, in class alpha. Uh, and now we want to define what it means for this collection to be influential, all right? To affect the number of closed Reeve orbits for contact forms nearby, okay? So this would be a definition. So we see that this collection uh, alpha T, let's just say, is rigid. If the following three properties hold, so of course these properties should be ones we've seen before in the examples we know. So all the orbits here, we want them to be simple. Hopefully our description of the Eklund and Lazarus theorem tells us that simple orbits are kind of the influential ones. Uh, or the first one to look for. Uh, next, uh, so this puts conditions on on T sometimes. Uh, so let's say if alpha is the trivial class, uh, then uh, uh, T must be less than. Uh, 2t min. Okay? You can't go too, too far. Okay? Uh, in fact, uh, we need more. Because we're aiming for generality, we're going to uh, assume more. Uh, we want t to be less than t min, the smallest period plus the smallest period in class alpha. Okay? So it's it's going it can be bigger than this, but not by more than this. Okay. And finally, we want T to be isolated from above in the set of periods of class alpha. Okay. There is no decreasing sequence 
in T alpha converging to T. Okay, it's isolated from above. Okay? So these things are all true in the examples and theorems we've discussed, but we kind of want them to be true for our general setup. Okay? Uh, and so if uh, our collection is rigid, then we can consider this number T plus, uh, which is the closest element in T alpha to T. Sorry, uh, to T and T alpha. Closest element greater than T. All right. Uh, so let's uh, just describe what these things look like in some of the flows we've discussed. So for example, If we look at the collection of orbits in the class of the fiber uh, and we choose T to be the period of the fiber, uh, then the closest <coughs> then this is uh, rigid. Uh, and, well, it depends on the homotopy class of the fiber, but at worst, it's T plus greater than or equal to 2 pi. Okay? Yes? Uh, Well, T min is pi and T min alpha is pi. T min is over all homotopy classes, not just in fact. Yeah. Uh, so another example, uh, suppose we took M uh, <coughs> to be uh, a unit cotangent bundle over uh, a Ramanian manifold, uh, which is hyperbolic. Okay. Uh, and let's choose the class alpha, which is primitive. Uh, then if we look at the collection of all clothes, so this admits a natural, as, as has been discussed, this admits a natural contact form whose read flow correspond is the co-geodesic form. Uh, <coughs> so if we look at the collection of orbits in class alpha of period T min alpha, uh, then T plus is actually equal to infinity in that case. There's not another closed orbit in that class. Okay? <coughs> All right. Uh, so now we can state the most general version of the, well, the, one, the most general version I can prove of this uh, rigidity phenomenon. And the statement is messy because it's, it's very general. Uh, so let me uh, state it carefully. So this would be theorem B. Uh, so let's say we have a rigid collection. So 
of our closed manifold m lambda naught. And then we want to uh, consider another contact form. And we want to uh, show the influence of uh, this rigid object on the Reeves flow of this nearby contact form. Okay, uh, so uh, we need some uh, measurement of the size of the influence of this. So some analog of n plus one. Okay, uh, so uh, as an aside, so we will define. Uh, a Hamiltonian floor homology uh, whose rank corresponding to this uh, rigid collection. Uh, so, in for, uh, so it's not true that it's uh, it's well defined up to canonical isomorphism, but its rank is unique. Its rank is well defined. So just as a, a warning, uh, so we have to work with floor homology, and we always want to only see simple orbits. That would be the technical challenge. Okay, uh, and so when I discuss the Floor hom homological setup, you'll see that in more detail, but this is just a, a hint at uh, what's. So I'm going to associate Hamiltonians to this rigid object, and each one of them will have a floor homology, and all the floor homologies are not canonically isomorphic, but they all have the same rank. So you can't, so in other words, in the space of all these floor homologies, you can't net, there's, it, it depends. So the isomorphism depends on how you go from one to the other, but you can always go to one to the other and get an isomorphism. But the isomorphisms might be different, different paths you take. Does that make sense? Yes, yeah, so I, I haven't, the Hamiltonian? The fa I'm gonna work with a family of Hamiltonians. But yeah, it's a parameterized family of Hamiltonians. Yes. Yeah, so this is the fixed data. Yeah, so if you change the, and we'll, I'll show you examples where we get different numbers with different uh, forms. Okay, uh, so I have just enough time to state it. Uh, so uh, if, as usual, max f over min f is less than, and now what appears here is not two, uh, it's the minimum of two numbers. The first is t plus over t. Okay, that's greater than one and can be infinite. Uh, <clears throat> and the other one is uh, t min plus t min alpha over t. And that's greater than one by assumption. Okay, t is less than this quantity. T is less than this quantity. Okay? Uh, good. I'll tell you why we need that term in a second. Uh, and in this general setting, uh, we actually need a non-degeneracy orbits, uh, non-degeneracy assumption. All orbits of alpha of lambda uh, in class alpha with period 
in the closed interval. Uh, so if they're uh, non-degenerate, then they're at least the rank of this homology of them. Okay. Uh, Distinct order. Okay, so I warned you that the statement was ugly. I'm only uh, half done with the statement. Uh, I can finish it, but let me uh, at least tell you something about what's going on. Uh, one point of this result is that it implies the least possible things about the ambient contact manifold. Okay? So we don't assume that it admits a, some, a filling. Okay? It could be over twisted, which also complicates Hamiltonian floor theory. Okay? So I'll give an example of an application later, but we want to make it as general as possible. And so the uh, price we pay for not assuming we have a symplectic filling is this term. This will lead to compactness results that we need. Okay? So that's the price we pay for no filling. All right? So this, compared to the other statements, this is only half a statement because we don't have conditions uh, when this things are uh, geometrically distinct, uh, but the assertions are roughly the same. Uh, so let me just finish by stating them, and then I'll do examples and proofs next time. Uh, so the orbits are geometrically distinct. If the class alpha, again, if any of the, if either of these two conditions are met, if alpha is primitive or the order of alpha is infinite. Okay, so there are topological uh, reasonable topological conditions under which we're getting geometrically distinct orbits. Otherwise, they're distinct if no closed orbits of period less than <coughs> one over the order of alpha t max f minus t min min f. Okay? Uh, in a class whose multiple is alpha. All right. Uh, so next time I'll apply this to some simple over-twisted contact structures uh, and get some estimates and then we'll talk about the proof. So I'll stop here.